What's up, everybody? Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I am joined today by Tommy Thornton of Hedge Fund Telemetry. Prior portfolio manager, now he writes a daily briefing for investors just like myself, uh, private investors, institutional investors, buy side, sell side, where he breaks down what he's seeing in the market and how he's allocating his capital. Now, Tommy is a very technically uh, technical sentiment driven investor. And I thought this was really interesting because I actually consider myself to be more of a sentiment driven investor. However, Tommy's approach is light years more technical than mine. And I really enjoyed this conversation. I expected to talk to Tommy for about 20 minutes and we went close to an hour because of how much value I kept on uncovering. So I really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. As always, if you do, uh, right beneath this video is a pinned comment where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter where I break down conversations just like this and plenty others discuss industries that I'm quite excited about and where I'm putting my capital today. It's a free newsletter I publish every week and I love writing it. The link to subscribe is right beneath this video. I'd love to have you join the team. Okay, Tommy Thornton, Hedge Fund Telemetry. I hope you enjoy. What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation. And that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, guys, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House. And I'm joined right now by Tommy Thornton, the president at Hedge Fund Telemetry. Tommy, it's the first time on the show. Thanks so much for making the time. Hey, Jay. Nice to, nice to be here. And uh, thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. Now, for anyone who's not familiar, only because it's your first time on, on my show, even though um, you're on a lot of comparable channels all the time, Real Vision being a main one, which we just talked about. But give us the, the highlight reel, Tommy, the 30 second commercial. How do you spend your time? What do you focus on? Well, uh, hedge fund telemetry is an offshoot of the research that I did for over 10 years at a hedge fund where I was a partner. And I look top down on the markets, uh, macro markets, and I have a focus on U.S. equities, long, short. Uh, I'm a contrarian, and I use some esoteric technical models, uh, such as uh, Tom DeMarc. And I also am a specialist looking at market sentiment. Okay, yeah, and that's what I know you for, is the, is the sentiment. And actually... You know, just to Raul Paul from Real Vision calls you out as being the analyst uh, in terms of gauging sentiment, the analyst that most investors follow or should follow. So what do you watch then? Because, I, you know, it's funny, I consider myself to be a, a sentiment based investor as well, because I watch trends, I watch retail investor dollars moving this way and that. And that helps me make my decisions in terms of like uh, validating a thesis. If I'm bullish on something, that's great. And maybe the 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 macro fundamentals are my favor, but I also want to make sure I'm a year early. I'm not 10 years early, right? So how do you utilize, how do you gauge, and then how do you utilize sentiment, Tommy? I look at all the market sentiment polls out there. I use the, the daily sentiment index data from Jake Bernstein, who's tracked it daily through since, you know, 1987. And I, I remember, um, Back in my early days, um, in early 2000s, uh, I met Paul Tudor Jones, and he told me that he loved the Daily Sentiment Index. So it comes in raw data. And so what I've done is I've converted all that data on, onto charts. So I can see when the average, and these are, they're not pulling Paul Tudor Jones or Ray Dalio or Stan Dr Druckenmiller, uh, but they're pulling the average investor on about 40 different markets. So when it gets to the high 90 level, uh, that is an extreme level. Now, sentiment is a condition, and that's very important because it can stay very bullish or it can stay very bearish for a considerable amount of time. It's when that turns, um, either the bullishness turns down or the bearishness turns up. And you want to follow that trend. And I use triggers such as DeMarc indicators and some other very basic technical in indicators, sometimes uh, a moving average of the sentiment when I see the actual raw price drop below the moving average and the moving average of that sentiment. So let's say a 20-day moving average starts to decline. 
I see a trend develop and mm-hmm. that's what I tend to do. And for example, everybody's been talking about lumber lately and it's everything is, oh my God, lumber prices are going crazy. And they went so high and the sentiment stuff that I got was around 96% bullish and it stayed at that. It was sort of pegged at that high level for a few weeks. And then we had some other indicators that said, Hey, this is getting a little toppy and it it crashed. I think almost 50% from the highs and we're now, I think the sentiment hit six uh, just a a few days ago, six, like single digit, single digit. And another thing is uh, back in, I think it was December of 2019, market sentiment on the S&P was elevated over 80% for quite a while. And then we started to see some divergences happening. We saw some DeMarc signals occur. And one of the things with DeMarc signals, I track and and show every day the number of individual S&P stocks that have upside exhaustion signals. And we had just a huge number. And this was right before COVID hit. So we started seeing divergences happening. Market sentiment was really high. And then everything started to fall apart, as we know, based off of COVID. And that was the catalyst that that did it. But we were in in advance of that. Now, in March, all I could see were, on the other side, buy signals, buy exhaustion signals happening. So in other words, everything was going down so fast that Um, This was saying the market was getting exhausted. Market sentiment was at 4% on March 23rd. And that was right before the Fed came in and gave their monster stimulus and said they would support the market and the market went up. And within a couple of days, uh, the market sentiment went over the 20-day moving average of sentiment and it really never looked back. So we really had you know, back in at times where the market is so elevated, and I would call this period right now very elevated, we, we don't have a lot of people that will agree with us on that. If we say, look, this is elevated, there's risk to the downside. Uh, I don't usually get a lot of people that say, hey, you're right on. Uh, I'm not going on CNBC because th- they would just laugh at me. And, you know, that's, you know, typically what, what happens on those uh, big shows. But in March, we turned bullish because we had enough evidence on the downside to say, hey, look, we're seeing upside potential here, even though it's a pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen. You're talking so I went out 2020 like, still, right? Yeah, right. yeah, March 2020. And yeah. we went out and we put together a basket of the best quality companies uh, that we could find. And those were Apple, Microsoft, things that you just always wanted to buy. And this was an opportunity. So we 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 turn bullish. And truth be told, um, I scaled out of a lot of those positions after really good gains. Mm. uh, And I honestly did not expect the market to continue um, with these levels. I don't think a lot of people at that time did either. But the other thing is, I also am a contrarian. So I find pockets of areas where I can short. Um, We just uh, covered a bunch of uh, uh, transports we had some energy stocks that uh, we've liked a long time, but we just did a contrarian trade on the short side. And we covered those last week uh, towards the lows, and that worked out pretty well. So I'm, I'm trying to stick and jab in this market. It's not an easy one because it seems like every other day is it's flip-flopping from growth to value. Rates are up, rates are down. So it's, it's really, really challenging. Yeah. Okay. So a whole bunch of things I want to pull on there. When you talk about, so that the, the pivot in lumber sentiment, super notable, right? And granted, I don't, I don't watch these numbers like you do. So I lack some context, but to, to move from 96 on the sentiment scale down to a six, do you think there will now be a reversion to the mean somewhere in the middle? Or is that trade just, what are your thoughts on? Cause you know, Inflated commodity prices have been one of the number one topics of discussion on my show and all my peers. And so I was kind of wondering where you're at on that topic. Right. The other um, commodities that we were short and we covered uh, were corn, wheat, and soybeans. And we had market sentiment was uh, very, very high there. And again, 
Everybody was talking about it. It was an easy discussion to talk about. Hey, commodity prices are going up. Everything's going up, 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 up. Right. But it already had gone up and we had already seen, you know, the big move up. And so when people are talking about it and I can tune on to CNBC and when they're talking about each day, certain stocks, you can already tell that these things have had their big run. And it's, you don't necessarily want to be saying, I, I'm going to buy something super high after it's moved and it's in the news. I, I, I tend to be an investor, like maybe like a farmer and I like to garden and, you know, I have a wife and three daughters. So I've built gardens in our house. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like to put things in the ground early and watch them grow. And nobody really wants to get on, nobody wants to have someone on TV, especially financial TV, that, that's going to say, look, I like this idea here um, because I see the potential. No, they want to talk about the tree with the apples that are already you know, on there to be picked. And that's what I try to do as a contrarian. I look for short ideas where the apple tree is full and they're starting to fall off the tree. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's kind of the uh, analogy I can. can Yeah, no, I'm with you. Okay. So, so on that note, I've been actually exiting uh, many positions in the last month and I've been just building cash. Right. And Mm -hmm. uh, what are you seeing in the market? Where, where, where are the short opportunities? Because obviously I'm, I'm expecting a buying opportunity sometime in the next six months. That's why I'm consolidating cash. What are you seeing though, Tommy? Uh, well, you know, calling tops is is a tricky thing, and I've called you know plenty in my life, and some have worked really well. Some, you know, we get stopped out, and so I, again, I took a bunch of shorts off because I was opportunistic, and I had some that that were up double digits. And again, I'm stick, you know, a stick jab type market. It's uh, what I think is a, a risky place right now is that there are a lot of people that are crowded into technology stocks, some of the big mega cap stocks, and we're going to have Q2 earnings coming out starting in about a month. And I think you're going to start to see margin pressure uh, in, infect their, uh, their earnings. And that's because you've had higher input costs from the recent surge in commodities. And you also have wage increases that are going to cause some margin pressure. And I think that will probably be a sign that investors are going to get nervous going into the next few quarters. And that could be priced in perhaps in the third quarter. And the other thing is, you know, job job growth um, or the jobs coming back into the market uh, or into the the, uh, the data, we haven't really seen great numbers. We've seen, you know, these numbers are extraordinarily good, but it's they're not being, re, you know, there's no new jobs being created. These are jobs, just people coming back into the market. And I think probably starting in September or and maybe October, uh, we're going to see that data really improve a lot. And it could give people a lot of concerns about it inflation, uh, maybe peak levels. But for me, I think that we've had this big surge and now we're going to start to peak and we're going to go back to normal. I mean, we're all, we're all outside. We're going to restaurants, masks are off and people are traveling again. You know, there's a lot of travel stocks and airlines, hotels, theme parks, restaurants, I mean, things that are associated with travel and and reopening that were up a lot more than they were Mm pre-COVID. So there's a big surge in those and people have crowded into those. So I'd be watching how restaurants and the airlines and others are, are trading for signs that we could see, you know, further declines, but the, the big mega cap tech names have led the majority of gains in the last 10 years And I just think that dominance is going to, and they're great companies, don't get me wrong, and I own some, but I I think that that dominance is going to come to an end, Hmm, maybe in the next, maybe the the July quarter, maybe 
um, the October quarter. And I think, yeah, you'll have a correction. And I think there's going to be the hangover effect after all the stimulus and all the good times. Uh, it's going to be like, oh, crap, we're getting back to normal. And normal's sort of boring and growth could slow because we've had such strong growth. So mm. that's that's really my thesis for the next uh, two or three quarters. So you're not buying from the sounds of it, the runaway inflation thesis, which I'm seeing pundits left, right and center call for runaway inflation. And it's easy to argue for Like I get it, you know, because if you're getting hit at the gas pump or your avocados at the grocery store, food prices here and there. And, and, you know, you mentioned lumber and a few commodities definitely surged. Right. Um, but <clears throat> when, you know, when I, when I, when I hear the runaway inflation, and I've been interviewing a lot of people actually last week and this week and whatnot, just to poke holes in that theory, because whenever I see consensus in an idea, then I try to find the contrarians like yourself and say, help me stress test this. Like what's wrong with it. Right. And so I've had all the, the last deflation is standing on the show from David Rosenberg, Jeff Snyder, Dr. Lacey Hines, just to poke holes in the runaway inflation theory. And they've done a great job. I mean, I, you know, it, it's it seems very logical when you think about it critically, they're like, you know, th there's, First of all, deflationary influence is all over any technology-based service, right? And that you can't ignore that, but it's less offensive to you because when you pay less for something, it doesn't hit you in the, you know, whereas when you have to pay more, you remember that and you point your finger at it and say, something's going on here, right? But obviously you're not buying into the runaway inflation thesis. I, you know, there's the transitory and the structural debate. Okay. And... Uh, a few of the people uh, like David Rosenberg and Lacey Hunt, I've read their work. Um, I've also read the runaway inflation uh, people that are, you know, you know, gold's going to go to 3000. Um, the dollar is going to go down. Everything is, you know, I, I see both sides. And what I tend to find, and you probably will agree, is they generally have the same opinion always. They don't ever change their mind. And that to me is something that you have to have a somewhat open mind to and see when there is inflation, you want to, you know, go on the inflation scare or, or, and there's going to be deflation. And I've seen, I've seen both, but then again, the people that, that, that are have talked about the end of the world for you know, with deflation or inflation, you got to take them with a grain of salt and you have to, you know, balance that out. Um, for me, I think that inflation right now, there is some transitory stuff. I don't think used car prices are going to continue to go up 10% every month. I think hotel prices are going to start to moderate. I think airline prices will start to moderate. Again, we're going to come back to normal on a lot of stuff, corn, wheat, soybeans, it's going to be one thing that one of the reasons why I was short those besides having some other signals that I tend to use uh, seasonality. These things tend to go up into the summer. Uh, you know, it's going to be a hot summer. It's good. You know, the crops aren't going to be that great and there's a big demand for it. And then all of a sudden it starts to, you know, they start to fall apart um, in June, July, uh, when there's a bountiful crop. Uh, sometimes th that's off, but it's a really good predictable thing. Now, wages, that I think is a structural inflation situation right now. And I don't know if the Fed or the government really is behind the need to keep paying people to sit home so companies will entice them to come back to work by paying them more. I mean, one thing that we've had in this market, uh, in the economy for 10 years coming out of the, you know, the 09 low, wages haven't gone up anywhere. I mean, I shouldn't say anywhere, but you've had deflation in wages um, based off of, I, I mean, I guess, you know, a, a longer period of time. And that's been a big problem with inequality um, I, you know, you, you have the top, t you know, tier people still making tons of money and the rest of everybody gets beat up uh, and, and needs more government assistance. 
So I will say this, that, that part of the reasons why I think the, the job numbers will improve is I think that you'll see the government start to pull back on some of the free um, jobless benefits that they're getting. Now, I know, I know some people that, uh, that have been taking unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, younger people I know, and I'm like, hey, what's the story with the job search? Because they lost their job during the pandemic. Well, you know, I'm getting pretty good money on unemployment, so I'm really not in a big hurry. But that's going to end, and I think there's going to be a big rush to find a job come September. And also, you're going to have teachers back, and teachers have been um, unemployed and taking unemployment. So that, I think, is going to be a, a good thing right there. So I'm... Um, so, yeah, go on. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, okay. So, you know, before we hit record, you mentioned you were reading Daniel Kahneman's new book, Noise. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was excited because I just finished Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's a book that I've, I, I, I really value. And I've read a handful of the chapters a couple times already. And I'm looking forward to reading his next book, Noise. Um, which is really all about behavioral economics, or at least thinking fast and slow is. And I imagine noise is kind of a, a follow-up mm -hmm. to that. Why do you value um, understanding behavioral economics as an investor, Tony? And what has it done for you? Um, I studied political science and economics in college, and I took some psychology classes. I didn't take enough psychology classes, in my opinion. And there's a lot you can really see uh, if you open your eyes, you read, you see how people are behaving. And I think the meme stocks and the crypto craze has been something that is a really good example that reminds me of back in the 90s and uh, 2000 when people were making money hand over fist day trading they were leaving their jobs mm -hmm. because they i'm gonna i'm just gonna day trade and we know how that turned out but the problem i see right now is and it you know goes into the day port noise and and these other pumpers that that you know say that you know you go on tiktok and you see all these people that have started trading in the last year and saying, uh, this is what I do. This is how much money I'm making and yada, yada, yada. That's late stage. That doesn't last. And there's a real bad per pervasive issue happening with millennials. And I, I, I imagine uh, people that are, that are not working, uh, even older, that it's a get rich type thing. So they're chasing things that are green that have already worked, that are going up parabolically each day. So there's a new thing every day to, to chase. There's a new GME. There's a new coin. Uh, if Elon Musk says to, you know, he posts a meme of Dogecoin or it, it's people just without regard go out and buy these things. And, and we've seen the, the problem that happens is, and what we've seen happen is, this whole crowd will go from one thing to another and leave the other thing that was just good, you know, the, the bag holders there, mm. uh, you know, being suckered into it. I mean, I, I can say also that the, 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 one of the things that I watch for and I look for short ideas all the time is seeing the, 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 interest in something start to peter out like it, i just short i shorted gme uh, a few weeks ago it was higher and yeah. i covered it i covered it before the a weekend because as i said to people i said look i want to sleep over the weekend i don't want to be dealing with this and wake up for a nightmare mm -hmm. but it, it's avoiding the obvious that's something that i have written down on my desk to to do just avoid the obvious Easy trade, whether it's on the long side or, or the short side. Sometimes it's hard, and it's a great study when I say I'm shorting cor corn, soybeans, and wheat. I'll say it on Twitter, or I'll say that, you know, I think Bitcoin at 60,000 has a sell signal. 
and I get somebody that says good luck. And when someone says good luck, that's a facetious way of saying, I think you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And if I get some people that, that, and that, that say, Oh, that's, I'm so there with you on that. Then I, I, I'm like, maybe I don't have much of an edge here and maybe it's, it's too obvious. Interesting. And I, I can tell you this, that I've, I've worked with, with, I started my career in the early nineties. I worked for a retail broker. I worked for Morgan Stanley and I, we covered high net worth um, accounts and I, we had middle market hedge funds and hedge funds are perceived, and I worked for a hedge fund for a long time, they're perceived to be smarter, they're perceived to be, you know, big money, they can move things around and, and they get better access to things. And they don't make mistakes, but they make the same dumb mistakes as retail investors. You know, the, the thing with a retail investor is that it's their money. And a lot of times, you know, they're not on the clock every month to show performance or, or quarterly or yearly, and they're not getting paid a percentage of what gains they have. So there is that, you know, there's a difference there. There's the positives and the negatives for that. A retail guy can, you know, buy and sell and do whatever they want without any regard for accountability. But a hedge fund needs to have accountability, but they make the same dumb mistakes. I mean, this GameStop mm -hmm. with um, all the uh, Melvin Capital. And I, I, I will say this, that um, the guys at Melvin Capital are absolutely some of the smartest retail, I mean, retail consumer, retail oriented um, traders and in investors I've ever seen. They've killed it, killed it, killed it, killed it. But it was so stupid of them and, and how they structured it to where they lost the bazillions, I think twice in the same stock is just, it's hubris. And that generally will kill people. And when you start, when you, when you also see that shorts have covered and we have data that can see, you know, when the shorts are out of it, they've already covered it. It's got stocks gone up. That's actually a great sign. We tend to look for that because let's say GME goes up, all the shorts have covered and there's nobody really left to buy. All the, the chasers are in there and all that covering was demand and it's gone. So we look for that and that supply and demand is it's a behavioral thing that being in the markets for a few years like myself, I've been able to identify. Right, right. I mean, such a key thing you mentioned about when you're uh, validating an idea and you have somebody comment on it, either countering you with like a, a good luck, you know, type of, um, yeah, yeah, you know, masked, uh, masked uh, insult, whatever you want to call it. But that's the that's the epitome of a contrarian investor, right? You see somebody increasing your conviction, agreeing with you, and it makes you question the decision, right? Whereas it's counter to human nature, which is what happens so frequently in these trades, right? You you have a well, Bitcoin's the greatest example, the most recent example of believing in the fundamentals, believing in the ideology, whatever your reason was, just believing in it as a speculation doesn't matter. But every day the price goes up, your conviction is increased. I'm more correct than I was yesterday. Can't you see in the price? I'm even more correct the next day, right? And it's such a dangerous trap that investors fall in because every day you're more confident than the day before because you're validated, right? When, to your point, like you, you, you need to, I find, I need to battle to counter that mind and say, okay, no, now is the time to take cash off the table, whatever it is, right? But yes, we were correct. Great. Let's not get cocky. Let's not get overconfident and not be blinded by our own confidence, most importantly. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, when, like, I don't trade Bitcoin. It's not my thing. I analyze it for hedge fund telemetry. We, we look at it every day and I look at the charts and uh, we've generally had a pretty good read on it. And back in December 17th, 2017 or 18, 17, I believe, uh, the thing was going crazy. You had everybody on CNBC talking about it. 
And I got, lo and behold, a DeMarc exhaustion cell 13. I put it out there to everybody and I said, and, and at that time, I, I, I just was consulting mostly with hedge fund managers and friends and people that manage pensions and stuff like that. But I said, I, I'm not in this thing. If you are, this signal, mm, you might want to you know, take note. And then we made five waves down. Now, this is something really important. When, I, when people say Elliott wave, it's like they're. It's like people are clicking off your thing right now. But don't click off yet because I'm going to explain. <laughs> the most important things about Elliott Wave are the personalities of what are happening in each wave. So, for example, let's go back. I'm going to I'm going to hold off on crypto because or, or Bitcoin, but I'm going to talk about the S and P last or March 2020. Mm -hmm. We had five waves on the way down. Okay. And there are five waves typically with Elliott Wave. And the first wave, it starts off on the upside where nobody generally believes it's going higher. And I'd say that was pretty accurate back in March, April, May. And then we had a pullback and it didn't, it was a wave two pullback. And the wave two pullback, basically it's a, it's a lower high pullback People are saying, uh oh, we're going back down again. So we've got to, you know, you know, sell, we've got to get out. But it makes a it makes a, a, a higher low. And then it starts going up and it goes above the wave one high. And that's wave three. And wave three generally is a wave that can last a lot longer and it gets more people on board. Not everybody's on board yet, but it's a good wave and people are making money. They're getting back into it and their conviction is going higher as and bringing more people in as it goes higher. Now, then it stops and then we have another corrective pullback wave four. And that's a tricky one because a lot of people think it's over. They take their profits, but it's a very shallow pullback. And then we move back above the previous wave three high and we're in wave five and wave five is when generally everybody's on board. It lasts, it can last a while. Uh, the people that have been on the sidelines generally get back into it. And if you think back over the last, you know, year and a half or, or actually year and a quarter, we, we are, we were in wave five um, because you saw the, a ton of retail money come into this market. Uh, generally around October through January, up into the peak of the meme stock craziness. And then it started to get a little bit harder. And that to me was five waves higher. And I always tell people, I'm like, go to the Wikipedia page for Elliott Wave. Don't look at all the Fibonacci garbage. You'll just get, you know, you'll get lost. Mm -hmm. But look at the personalities. And if you can if you can identify the personalities that are that are happening within each of those waves, it, it's it's really it's really helpful to understand where you are in a trade. And it works the same way on the opposite side, on the downside. So I, I look at that all the time. Uh, and Bitcoin um, was a very good one when we had five waves down into um, the lows, I think it was a lows in the 3000 level. I had to mark buy signals and I was telling people, Hey, you know, maybe it's a buy here. You know, I, I and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, are you going to buy it? But the other thing that was happening is he had a, you know, he's on CNBC a lot. Uh, <laughs> he's an analyst that, that covers, you know, every market and he's been a crypto bull. He had giant price objectives at when it was going up. Oh, it's going to go up to a hundred thousand in six months. Mm -hmm. Was it seventeen thousand? And and when you see people make these really high price objectives or really low price objectives after a downward move, that's a sign in itself as well. When you're in a final move, so that person who I was just talking to uh, talking about, he suspended all of his price objectives. He said, no, "I'm not going to make any." 
more calls on the upside. And that was a sign that market sentiment on that on Bitcoin was getting washed out. And then it started to move up. We just, you know, this, I, I, and I'll be honest, I, I didn't think it would go as high as it did. I did have some models that said 56,000, which it, it took time to develop. It wasn't at 3,000. I said, it's going to 56,000, everybody. No, I didn't. It took time. And that's another thing. It takes time and you, you need to see how things move mm. before you can make those, you know, those pronouncements uh, of where things go. But whenever I see somebody up a price target on Tesla, to 1200 and then the next guy does the 1300 or you know th those are signs that i typically look at and say you know we're getting a little overdone here because those same people were putting lower price targets on tesla when it was at the lows which is very telling and it's it's yeah. a big trap that i always like avoid this you know because there's two things at play right when it comes to financial commentary there's people who have strong belief what they're saying is true and whether or not they're right they're honest about it you know but that's the minority of pundits in my experience the majority understand they're in the media business and it's they're in the media business first before financial analysis and so being as sensational as possible is better for business right uh runaway inflation is a hyper sensational headline bitcoin to a hundred thousand hyper sensational headline and that's going to get you the click that's going to get you the readership that's going to get people excited, especially if you can induce some fear in there, like an inflation thesis, right? You know, if you can induce some fear, all the better. Uh, but it's a trap for investors because getting sucked into that narrative isn't in your best interest. And, um, you know, it's it's hard to avoid. Um, and I've got a handful of rules that I follow to determine how much weight should I put on each perspective. But, you know, as a general rule of thumb, as long as I've got a basket of people that agree over here and disagree over there, and then I kind of find you know, craft my own thesis, usually somewhere in the middle, right? Um, and then yeah. take my best crack at it. You know, sometimes, um, like I, I took, I, I took level one, I passed level one from my CFA and that was like 20 something years ago. And that's when it was, you know, every year you take it every year. And I got, after I did it, um, my wife and I had a baby, just lots of, we were building a house, you know, lots of stuff was going on. And I got recruited to work for a hedge fund. And I never went back for a level two, but I, I, got, I felt like I, I, I got a fairly good uh, knowledge of what was happening. And I remember someone who I really respected said to me, it's going to be harder for you to get in there and buy something. You're going to be more skeptical about buying things. And it's true. I, I'm, you know, I have a hard time, honestly, this is, you know, something if I, you were my therapist, I would say I have a hard time buying into bubble stocks or high valuation stocks. And I have a higher threshold that I need to get over before I can say with, you know, certainty or, or with conviction that I want to buy something or I want to short something. And there's a lot of people that say, oh, I need 100% of all my indicators to line up perfectly valuation momentum whatever you know people focus on i tend to say that i need 70 percent. if i get 70 percent on something i'm going to take it if i get a majority mm. like that over 50 percent, i'm going to take the trade i'll do whatever i need to do uh and put that trade on it's the people that, that look for the 100 percent certainty and that's another thing and like financial media they're 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 broadcasting 100% certainty after the move. Right. So I, I, I think that that's, that's a pitfall that a lot of investors get in. And, and look, the, the, you know, my daughter's 21 and she's a film major in, in college. And when GameStop was going up, she FaceTimed me and she goes, Dad, what's this GameStop? What's going on here? Because all of her friends that were, you know, kids in school were on their Robin Hood trading GameStop, making money with it. It was the first time she's ever, ever asked me about what I do. And that was like a, like a thing, you know, this is like getting to a point where it's, it's, it's gotten weird. And, and, <laughs> <Right>. and <laughs> weird is like, 
you maybe you know exponentially but it, it was when you see those things and also when you see markets that are that are getting absolutely mauled and it's been getting mauled for a, a bit and you start to see it in the press you know if it's on nightly news <laughs> Take the other side of that trade. I mean, GameStop was on yeah. nightly news. And if you took the opposite end or side of that trade to the day, you would be, you know, making money. Mm. On it. It's not easy. It's not easy. But it's when that, when it's broadcast on the news, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of just wake up. You see the sign. Right. Yes. hundred percent. I love that. It's yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I always find it useful to ask the question, how can I be competitive here, right? If I'm looking at an idea, you know, what about me and my situation and my network and this idea is going to put me in the top 5%. Why can I be more competitive? Whether it's looking at some early stage speculations or whatever it is, it's like, but trading game, like I would never personally, I didn't touch it because I'm like, I don't know how to get ahead of the herd on this. I have nothing in my arsenal that's going to give me the edge over the competition. And so I'm staying off that court. I'll go find a court where I can outperform the majority. Um, you know, your comment, that, go ahead. That's actually, that's actually a great, um, that's like a Warren Buffett thing to say. It's exactly what Warren Buffett said in when I think it was 2000, uh, 2001, when the, the maybe 99, his letter, you know, they don't know technology. They, they didn't know technology. That wasn't their forte. That wasn't their specialty. I don't know crypto and I don't know how to value it. And I have, you know, I'm skeptical about the regulation of when that's going to come. So I just avoid it. I find other things that work for me. And there's a lot of people that, that have been touristy in, in let's say commodities this, this time when it's going up, Hey, let's hey, let's try these commodities. <laughs> let's see how that works. Right. Um, so stick to you know stick to what you know. And if you don't know, it's not you know it's a good learning experience. But the only way you learn is not by winning; it's by losing. Yeah. And that I mean that's that can be painful. Yeah, yeah. And you know it, it makes me think about your comment about your daughter and just expanding that to the whole generation of investors who have suddenly turned their attention to the market in the last year. And my optimistic brain says, well, this could be awesome. It could be a, a new generation that have suddenly uh, come to understand they need to put their cash to work, that the salary is not going to be enough. They need to get proactive with their wealth strategy and their retirement plan and all this stuff. Um, I brought that up with Grant Williams and he shut me down quickly and said, no, they're just going to get fleeced and walk away from the market for a decade, which is maybe more probable. I don't know, except for the outliers, right? Yeah, that's, that's a very Grant thing to say. Um, I've known Grant a long time. I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I would, I would look at it this way. There's going to be a lot of people, yeah, that will get, you know, run over and they're not going to invest again. And they're, the, because you've had this get rich fast immediately. Mm. I want to be on Instagram in Mykonos, you know, partying with all my friends, mm. but you know, that's the mentality. But there's also going to be a lot of people that are going to say, Hey, I made money. I've been able to cash out and maybe they're diversifying. Maybe they're learning more. There's so much to learn online from YouTube to newsletters to a lot of smart people, Real Vision, I'm on a lot. And I think that that's, it's a great, um, it's a great outlet to learn more about different things, how to invest, how to do things. There's a, you know, there's a bit of pumping on there for uh, certain assets that it gets a little overwhelming, but it's, a, it's an alternative view. And wow. So I'm optimistic that there's going to be more people uh, that will come away from all this craziness as better investors. And I also think that there's going to be a, a lot that, you know, they're going to say, well, that was fun. Not really. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they'll have to go back to work and have to grind it out. But I'm, I'm sort of a, 
I mean, you know, as everybody knows me, I'm, I'm sort of a skeptic, but I'm, it's also, I'm an optimist in, in many respects. I mean, I'm the glass half full. My wife's the glass half empty. And she, you know, is an interior designer and she, you know, creates beautiful things, but I'm, I'm the one that, you know, I'm shorting stocks. I'm optimistic that I'm right. You know, right. I'm optimistic for the future that I can continue to make money every month, no matter what type of market. So yeah. it's, you know, it's a dichotomy and I'm talking a lot about my family. here. <laughs> it's funny, you know, it, I've had to, uh, I, I'm definitely an optimist by design, right? And I think that's really served me as an entrepreneur, but I've had to learn to curb that when it comes to the market, specifically because my field is like really early stage, right? I invest in very early stage tech and in, in food companies and commodities but the, at the expiration stage. And, and in that you know, when, when 95% of these companies aren't going to make it. And my job is to find that 5% being an optimist, uh, can hurt, right? When you look at a, uh, a model or a business plan, you can say, well, it looks really good. All you have to do is solve these three things and it's a home run, right? Cause the entrepreneur and you know, it's, it's your job to run through brick walls, but the professional investor, and, and I've now learned to align myself with more cynical investors who say it would be a good opportunity except for these three things. And they're looking at the exact same thing that I am, just with the cynical brain, trying harder to say no before they ever consider saying yes. And that that was probably the first real uh, tangible lesson I learned as an investor was you got to turn your entrepreneur brain off and you got to think about this differently, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I've invested in a few private companies. And one, one of the things that I... I generally start with is who's running it you know, yes. who's behind it 100 percent. and the, the ones that i really like have already been successful doing other things and they have money behind them yeah and th they they don't need this necessarily to work mm. they want it to work they want it really bad to work mm -hmm. but they don't need it to work and it's the ones that are like super needy they need more money. Their 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 life depends on it, and it's they've, they've put a hundred percent of themselves into it. And then again, the, there are those that want it, that already have it, um, and have a stable life that want it a hundred percent as well. Yeah. But that's where I I tend to to start, and I start to look at at, at the management and the depth of that. I look at the you know, the need out there for this product or this service, um, who are their, co their competition? Uh, is this a company that is coming into a saturated market? Is it a company that's going to change the world? I get a little worried about those. Sure. Um, what I, one, um, I, I invested, well, actually I helped raise money for, Alibaba when I think it was like 2011 or 12. Um, in, and I, I worked for a fund that was just, was just shutting down. So I was um, looking for something to do. And one of my friends had a, um, had these connections in China and they were these princelings, these guys that are connected with the government. They had these private equity companies. They all went to Harvard business school together. And so my friend had this connection and he hit me up. And he said, hey, um, do you know anybody that might be interested in Alibaba? And it was pri private at the time, growing. It was the next, it was the Amazon in China. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me, you know, let me ask a few friends. I asked about 10 people and I had one guy, one friend bite. And he got another friend that he was a spinoff of his fund. And so we raised fifty million dollars. Okay. And the the price adjusted was around ten dollars, and I okay I did okay. I got a little payment on that. That was great, uh, but you know it was just I, I you know the, the 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 opportunity was there, and I had nine people say no, mm. and I had then the next one from my friend, and I had two days to to do this was the DD part of um, 
the Uber of China. And it was super early stage. I think, um, I think it was like 10% of the company. And this was like right when it launched. Okay. 10% of the company for $25 million valued at 250. Now they've merged with a few others um, and made it a bigger company. I think they bought the Uber portion of China, but they're going to go public for $70 billion. And now this is diluted. It's not necessarily 10% now, Yeah. but everybody passed on that. Everybody passed on that. Interesting. Yeah. Think about that. If even if it was a 1% stake for 25 million and it's a $700 million. Yeah. So you sometimes miss them and it's, <laughs> it's okay. You know, again, I can't, you can't swing at every pitch now and you can't do it in the equity markets either. So sometimes you miss them and there's, it, you probably know, so many venture people, early stage people that said, I, I had that one, but I passed. You got to learn from it. You got to say, well, why did I, why, you know, what did I miss? Yeah. You know, what, what did I not do? And there's a new bus every 15 minutes, right? That's mm -hmm. it. I never, I try hard. I don't know if I'm successful at it. Not to lose sleep over the one that got away that you almost said yes to and yeah, I, ended up being a home. I, I, hindsight is... Uh, I never look back. Like, I don't have any regrets. I have no regrets. I, I, I've traded a bazillion amount of shares of stock in my life. And I, if I held every single share, um, I could, you know, I could look back and say, oh, God, I'd be so rich if I still had Apple and, you know, <laughs> Amazon and all these things. But, yeah, you know, but I'm, my business is, is I, I'm a, I look at things monthly and quarterly and I can't handle 50% drawdowns. That's just not in my DNA. No. And that's it, right? Like it's, it's, uh, it's not a get rich quick scheme. That's what it comes back to. We touched on this. It's a get rich slow scheme or a go broke fast scheme way more frequently. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there selling early, whatever cash in your jeans, you can still deploy cash locked up in a position that's not performing, no liquidity. It's, it's out of play, right? Yep. can't have access to that. So, yeah. Um, you know, okay. So, you know, last thing, maybe I'll comment on just cause there's been some really great advice for, for new investors hitting the market. Um, and, uh, you just touched on, there's so much to learn and platforms like real vision, which you're a frequent guest on. I know you're on real vision today in a couple hours. So thanks for making time for me. Um, but, uh, I always tell new investors to determine your market time, like how much time, do you actually have to dedicate to your portfolio on a consistent basis, not this week or this month, but on a consistent basis, you know, month over month, year after year, right? And that will largely determine what kind of investor you maybe should be. And if you've only got an hour a day, maybe don't try to be a swing trader or a day trader, right? Maybe adjust your approach a little bit. And I've got my market time. Uh, for me, it's very early in the morning. I've got three kids and a small business. So by 8 a.m., I'm kind of shot, right? So 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., West Coast time, that's me. I'm in the market, you know, making decisions. But after that, it's kind of a crapshoot where my day is going to go. Um, do you have rules like that, Tommy, or any advice for new investors who are like, okay, I, I recognize there's an opportunity to generate more wealth if I understand how to deploy capital but I don't know what step one should be. Well, I'm a person that's been in front of computer screens maybe eight hours a day for the last 30 plus years. So, um, and I'm sitting in front of three monster screens right now. Uh, I, I'm used to it. <laughs> I sometimes think to myself, God, I've wasted so much time just looking at these things with green and, and red, you know, you know, it's like a video game for me. But what I would say, the most important things for an investor who wants to do well and not necessarily be in, in front of the screens all day or looking at their phone, which is really not a healthy thing, uh, sizing. Size your positions properly. My, my largest weight that I can put into a position is 5%. Okay. I generally start with a 1% position, sometimes 2%. And let's say it's going against me a little bit. I can add up to 5%. And, you know, there's those people that don't average down. I can average down. I don't mind if I stay within my limits of 5% per position. I also have 
stop limits. And people, it, it really varies on how much risk tolerance they want to have. So if, if you have a smaller position, a 1% position, and you, you have a wider stop limit because it's a volatile stock or a volatile sector, um, you're going to be able to ride out some of the, the turbulence. If you, if you have everything you have into GameStop and you see it go down 10%, which it can do it within five minutes or something, you're going to get stopped out. The other thing that I, don't, I recommend investors don't do is over leverage yourself. If you over leverage yourself, and I'm not saying you know leverage is, is so bad because I use leverage at times. You know you're, you're going to win bigger when it's working, but you're going to have that period where it's not working, and it's like you're you know you just fell off a boat, and instead of someone throwing you a life raft, they're throwing you a you know a, a bowling ball that you catch and it you go down a lot faster. Mm. So those are things that I would recommend people do. Don't concentrate too much into one particular sector, um, one particular asset class, uh, you know, and, and stick and jab when markets get to elevated levels. I mean, we've seen a huge move. It's not the time where you want to say, hey, I'm putting all my money now into the market. I want to push because I think we're going to go to 4,400 on the S&P. Well, maybe we will, but it's not necessarily the best risk reward at this point. Mm. So have that in mind, have insight of what's going on in the world, how people are viewing the world. If people seem a little too bullish in your friend group, that's, that's a sign right there. If people are not talking about the stock market and moving back, going to work in their old jobs, and that's also a sign that maybe things are getting washed out. Mm. But it's really just size limits, stock uh, uh, st- uh, stops, uh, and, and having them wide enough, particular uh, for the asset. You can have a sh- you can have a narrow, more narrow stop on a you know more less volatile stock like Microsoft or Apple. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's there's higher volatility tech stocks that can you know get you out of those really quick. So know what you're trading. Know what you're trading, have have size limits that you stick to. You know, you're not going to get, you know, if you put 100% in something and it goes up 100%, you're a genius, right? But you took enormous amounts of risk. And if you have a bunch of stocks, 20 stocks that are going up in sync together uh, at reasonable returns, you're going to do fine. Mm. Um, and and that, that to me is um, really it. Of, of my most basic stuff that I would tell anybody, any new investor, I would tell the same exact same thing. And it's worked for me and it's, it's worked for a lot of other people and it just stay in the game. Love that. Yeah. hundred percent. If you're all in, you can't afford to lose. Look, Tommy, so many gems today. Thanks so much. This has been super valuable. I'm really glad uh, we can make this happen and get you in front of my, my crew. So uh, Great. Thanks again, love to do it again sometime. Yeah, let's do it. Come find me when the markets get killed. You're going to see me say, oh my God, it's I'm buying everything. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm cashing up. So when that, when that occurs, it'll be my first phone call. As always, if you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe. I'd love to have you on the team. And if you want to take the next step and go a bit deeper with my content, I publish a free weekly newsletter every Friday where I debrief my portfolio. I distill the top lessons I've uncovered from the guests I've had on this show every week. And I talk about sectors and industries that I think are poised to move, areas I'm looking for opportunity and places that I'm allocating capital. I love writing it. We publish every Friday. The link is right beneath this video. Love to have you join the tribe.